Hello, everybody. Oh, oh God. my goodness! You know, hello. Uh, I'm, let, me, <coughs> let, let me let me handle this. Okay? Let's go, go for it. Naki has a cold. Um, where'd you get a cold? First, you got to say welcome back to the Daily Thread. Welcome back! Oh, welcome back, everyone, to the Daily Thread. <laughs> You're on the Daily Thread uh, yeah. network. I'm Larry Gordon. This is Naki Gordon. Yeah, I got uh, a cold. You got a cold. You don't want. I think you went to a hockey game. Were you from the ice? It was very cold to me. Uh, it could be a very this cold. This is be. We were sitting on the bridge. You know the bridge in MSG. Yeah. Freezing, okay. It's freezing up there. Really? You know, I Rangers. Rangers lost. I know. I saw that. Uh, I checked the score at the end of the night. Rangers were up two nothing. Really? It was five three. And then they let up four straight goals. The last goal was uh, empty net. I was yeah. figuring. Yeah. They were trying to tie the score. Anyway, you know, listen. You know, sports is very important uh, to to you and to to us and. To a lot of the, the listeners, it's good. Uh, it's a good. I wonder, by the way, if it's important to the listeners. I think it is. You think so? Okay. Not, not everybody wants we'll to go, hear something. We'll go. We'll go under that assumption. Not everything. Everybody wants to hear something heavy uh, uh, all the time. But you know, for many years I was on the radio uh, back in the 1970s and the 1980s, mm-hmm. and some days I was on every single day for two hours. And WFMU in the morning from seven to nine a.m. And then WNYM in the evening, sometimes for three hours. And sometimes I had like a really, really bad cold. And my voice was like very, very, very deep when I had a bad cold. And I used to hear my headphones. I said, I don't recognize that voice. Who is that? It sounds so much better than me when I don't have a cold. Mm. So the show the show must go on. The show the show must go so on. So here I am. Here yes, I am the sitting mail, here. The mail must go through and the show must go on. It was beautifully, uh, here in New York, it was beautifully clear this morning. I don't know what happened. Well, well I don't know sudden, what time you woke up. Very early. I get so, up very early. I think that was considered yesterday was clear. No, I get up uh, in New York time. I get up like five a.m. I hear you, and I'm ready for I'm ready to start the day. Um, but uh, like you said, the Rangers lost the other night. The Knicks lost. Uh, the Mets and Yankees are long gone, of course. The Jets. Well, one of them will be as long gone. Jets did well. So, and today um, there's a big there's a yeah big, USA big versus match. Iran. 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 You gotta say Iran. <laughs> you saw that press conference? Yes, I did. The USA versus Iran. For those who don't know, the press conference. Uh, they're asking a USA player how he deals with the oppressiveness and the oppression. How does he feel playing for a country that is so racist and, op- <laughs> and oppressive, like the U.S.? Yeah. I think it was a, it was an Iranian reporter, right? And right. the reporter said, "Well, first of all, you pronounce our country's name wrong. It's Iran, yeah, not yeah, Iran." Yeah. That was Tyler. Uh, uh, what's his name? The <coughs> He's a captain of the, of the team. team. Um, Tyler, I don't know his last. What's his last name? Do you know? Let's just go with uh, Johnson. Uh, no, it's not Johnson. It's Tyler something or other. Uh, anyway, so, you know, uh, the interesting thing about today's game is I had two thoughts about it. Number one, wouldn't it be interesting if there weren't any wars in the world, if <laughs> Russia and Ukraine could play like a soccer game to see who gets Crimea and who gets uh, oh my gosh. That's other like, areas? It's like the Hunger uh, Games, Abba. It would, say, it would, save, a, it would save a lot of, uh, a lot of lives. I mean, what, what, do you, what do you get from war? Besides a lot of dead people and a lot of broken families and a lot of disputes. So why don't we just play rock, paper, scissors for who gets a country then? <laughs> well, or ping pong it, match. There seems to be more attention being paid to soccer. I mean, this is an important, uh, this is an important game. Well, first of all, the Iranian, there's two things I want to say about well, there's this. eight things I want to say, so okay. you go first. Uh, let me say, there's two things I want to say about <coughs> this. Iran, if Iran doesn't win, you can be sure that these guys are going to suffer. If they go back home to Iran, uh, in some fashion, they're going to su- be made to suffer by the regime. Number number two, if they don't cooperate or if they ask for political asylum in Qatar, which is unlikely because Qatar. you know it's, Qatar is very close to the Iranian regime. Also, by the way, uh, the only Qatar gets a lot away with a lot of stuff because they have Qatar. many trillions of dollars, so they get get away with a lot of things. But uh, the uh, they haven't the players, the Iranian players. The Iranian players haven't been singing the national anthem in where protest. Are they, where are they playing? In Qatar. In Qatar? Yeah. Uh, there's two games. Um, <laughs> two different countries? <laughs> two different countries. There's Jersey and <laughs> there's Jersey and Jersey. Right. Um, so um, if, they, if they don't, if they haven't sung the national anthem and they've already been threatened that if they don't behave that they're going to be made to suffer in some fashion when they yeah, when I saw, they get I back. Saw, I saw a headline here that Iran is threatening tor- threatening to torture soccer players' families. If T- what? T- if Iran reportedly using relative of its World Cup team players as, a, as insurance policy against misbehavior, including refusal to sing the anthem. Uh, and what if they don't win? If they don't win, I would think they would, the regime is going to... I mean, they really want to win bad. Okay, I'm not trying to belittle um, or just you know brush away a war and what's at stake in many wars. 
Some wars are called for and, and proper and justified in some instances. But uh, sometimes it's just foolish. And just at the end of the day, when you look back at it, you just, a lot of death and destruction. Speaking of death and destruction, there's something that I read over Shabbos. Um, is that when Qatar was building their infrastructure, which cost them a, a couple hundred billion dollars mm -hmm. to host the World Cup? Yeah, this yeah. Um, reportedly, over sixty five hundred workers died in the construction during the construction process. Died from the desert heat. They died from the conditions, subhuman conditions. And it's so it's just so strange that the whole world was celebrating this World Cup, and it's a game and everything. But sixty five hundred families well i, were, I bet you destroyed if you look a little bit deeper into it they don't use local people for their i don't uh, care who they use it's i'm just telling human you, life it's uh, absolutely do you know a couple of people died uh, building the verrazano narrows bridge a couple of people yeah listen 6500 <laughs> that's where did you see that I saw I saw it in an article in Mishpacha magazine on Shabbos. Sixty five hundred people bu died building the stay from the heat. You said from 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 the conditions from the heat. Can you imagine? First of all, how many years did it take to build this? Many years. So it's not like it happened in one year. But you know, they said that there's m multiple reasons why Qatar wanted to host the World Cup. Yeah. None of them are because they love soccer. It's mainly yeah. because of the you know how it makes them look in the in the public light that they're hosting different countries like Israel and mm -hmm. other Arab Arab uh, nations uh, in the US um but i don't know that seems a little bit crazy that we're here watching this game and well that's double the uh, amount of people that died during 911 died while building the stadium <laughs> listen that's, that's an unknown piece of information it's un unknown it was published in an article i know i mean i haven't heard it any place else before uh, before you mentioned it, you're making me fact check. Uh, if you fact check that, that certainly how uh, many people died really in the Qatar you, the infrastructure saw, of the World you Cup? See it? You saw it in Mishpacha magazine. Yeah, uh, what was the article about? It wasn't just about who died building the soccer uh, facility. Well, to be honest, with those numbers, it could have been and it should have been. Oh, well, uh, very interesting. Anyway, uh, Qatar is uh, Qatar. <coughs> Qatar is an interesting, uh, interesting country because. They're trying to is break. Somebody threatening you to what? say. Is somebody threatening no, you that no, you have to no. say Qatar? No, no, absolutely not. Absolutely pretty, not. Uh, that's how the American, that's how the U.S. administration refers to it as. Since when do we follow what the U.S. That administration? How, that, that's how the it. military people refer to it. You want to say Qatar? You joining the army? I happen to like Qatar better than Qatar because Qatar you could be uh, you could misunderstand what they're talking about. Yeah. But you, you happen to speaking about uh, you know uh, populations that are. Uh, that are run by uh, dictators uh, like Iran. Um, you see, I don't know if you saw the New York Post today, but there's uh, or the news last night, but there's widespread protests in China mm. uh, taking place uh, against the uh, uh, against the uh, government government. Uh, you know, which COVID zero policy. You know, there's, there's uh, the zero zero COVID uh, zero COVID policy is number one, and uh, they're holding up the protests are holding up white papers. Blank, blank cards and blank papers. What is that? So the question is, why? Why are they? Why? Why are they holding up blank things? Because, you know, they're not holding up signs that say "Free the People" or "We want uh, no no censorship now." Uh, they're holding up blank, um, blank uh, pieces of paper and blank cards because they're not being allowed to speak. They're not uh -huh. being allowed access to information, and they're not being allowed to speak. It's that, uh, and that's what they feel that this, these white cards uh, represent. You know, uh, silence. They're being silenced. They're being uh, uh, not allowed to speak and not allowed to hear. Uh, very sophisticated way to protest. Very smart. I wonder who came up with the idea. Someone in China. Or maybe someone? the same person who created the coronavirus in Wuhan. Someone on Madison Avenue, uh, maybe. Anyway, it's interesting. Uh, we're getting a lot of interesting feedback from from people from all around the world. Uh, yeah, yeah. Something that's uh, that Liz Wheeler tweeted last night, uh, or actually a couple of days ago, rather. If Apple and Google boot Twitter from their app stores, Elon Musk should produce his own smartphone. Half the country would happily ditch the biased snooping iPhone and Android. The man builds rockets to Mars. A silly little smartphone should be easy, right? Uh, Elon Musk actually took to Twitter to respond to that. He said, "I hope, I hope." I certainly hope it does not come to that. But yes, if there's no other choice, I will make an alternative phone. <laughs> now, the question really is <laughs> for you and Apple. our... He could destroy Apple. For you and our listeners, would you ditch your current carrier or your current phone, rather? Like, if would you ditch would you ditch your iPhone and your Android to buy a Musk phone? 
Um, I certainly would. Uh, if Apple's not going to carry Twitter because they don't like the fact that uh, he may release the information, he wants to release the exchange of uh, emails and communications that led to the censorship of the Hunter Biden uh, information prior to the 2020 election. And the people like Apple and other high-tech uh, 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 groups and networks uh, who are complicit with the Biden administration and trying to suppress information, n doing things that are not that much different than what China or Iran do, trying to control the flow of information. It's pretty cray cray. Uh, and what, what? It's crazy. And what makes America great is, is the First Amendment, the right to free speech. We have a right to express ourselves, a right to hear things that uh, are unpleasant, and we have a right not to hear them if we so choose. It's funny that the, that the party that is so into freedom to express themselves in the craziest of ways that have no semblance of what a marriage really is and, and, and they could be a dog and a cat, they have an issue with free speech. Um, well, they don't, they don't have an issue with, on those subjects. That's too free, believe it or not. If there is such a thing, it's, it's, it's wild, the extremes that, that that has gone to. But they want to suppress certain information that will reflect, reflect negatively on the uh, political nature of who runs the country. And, and that's what it's about. That's what all these countries, I think, are about um, money and power. Uh, I think power comes first. And when you have power, you can control the money. I just read this morning that since the election of Ember 8th here in New York State, uh, Kathy Huckel vetoed over 50 bills brought to her by the legislature, which is dominated by liberals. And she didn't veto anything prior to the November 8th election because she wanted their support. Now she's vetoing everything because she doesn't want to spend money needlessly. Any kind, of, any kind of spending bill you brought to her desk before November 8th, because she was in a very close election with Lee Selden, before that, she uh, signed it into law. Now, she's not signing it into law. In case you're wondering, the New York State uh, annual budget is $220 billion. That's, exact, that's actually the amount that it took to build the infrastructure for, for Qatar's World Cup. And this just in, by the way, from... From our studio, according to the government, a Guardian analysis in February 2021 found that more than 6,500 migrant workers from India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka had died in Qatar since the award of the tournament. The death records were not categorized by occupation or place of work. The government has said that 30,000 foreign laborers were employed to build the World Cup stadiums. Uh, the average height temperatures in Qatar exceeded 100 degrees for in five summer. months of the year. Wow. Th though the tournament was moved from summer to winter for the safety of the comfort of the players, officials and fans, workers are at risk of accidents, heat-related illnesses, and other elements related to the physical and mental strains of working long hours in extreme heat. Suicide, suicide is also a concern. Construction workers frequently live in squalid conditions wow. that stand in stark contrast with the opulence of many of the facilities they build. So, yeah, there is your... Well, there's the idea of foreign workers that do uh, run the right uh, in, in the Arab countries, like those Gulf countries especially. That's wild, though. I don't workers. care where they live. Look, uh, look, look, what, look what Israel. Uh, Israel depends greatly on, on Palestinian workers from the territories. That's I think why. you're missing the point. You know, I know. I know 6,500 uh, of them killed, died. There's a, why are we watching the World Cup? There's a, uh, Can you address that? Uh, why are we watching the World Cup? I, wa I watched a few minutes, England and the U.S., and when I just saw them running back and forth and doing nothing else, I turned it off, you know. That's basically what it amounts to. Yeah. I think I bet you today someone uh, between U.S. and Iran, one of them is going to win one to nothing. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You want to take that bet to, like, FanDuel or something? Can you bet on FanDuel on that? Of course. Okay. I, I haven't looked at FanDuel since the baseball season was over. Well, you know what? Maybe take a look at it. Uh, here's a new headlight. A high headlight. Here's a headline from Bar Park 24. Mayor Adams completes Brooklyn Airv project by signing a 99-year lease for $1. Uh, a new air s surrounds all of Bar Park and most of Brooklyn thanks to the work of Brooklyn Airv Board and the VOD and the oversight of Rabbi Yaakov Zayda and 10 additional rabbis, notably, notably Rabbi Usher Eckstein and Rabbi Gavriel Zinner. Uh, we built an Airv around most of Brooklyn that has been functional since Yom Kippur, Rabbi Eli Umener, a board member of Brooklyn, told Bar Park 24. While many smaller kosher Erevin have long served many Jewish communities in Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Erev, which has extended the boundaries of most of the Erevin, covers many areas that were not previously included in any Erevin and can serve as a backup when other of the others of the Erevin go down. That's 
Well, that's very, very, people are very split about whether to use the air from Brooklyn. It's a good topic. You'll have people all the time telling you, uh, I don't want to go to Brooklyn for Shabbos. Why? Oh, because you can't carry in Brooklyn. Well, you, you can't. Well, there are a lot of people that do. A lot of people that do carry in, in Brooklyn. I've seen it. I've been, I've been in Borough Park for Shabbos. So I think Bar Park is like maybe I see them. They really do hold by the air. Some do, some some do, and some don't. <laughs> Listen, <coughs> you know what? What are they signing uh, an agreement with uh, with Eric Mayor Adams? Adams? I guess it's a lease. Uh, well, what are they leasing? You know what they're leasing? They they're Space. leasing uh, New York. They're using New York City property. Uh, and uh, most of the air, even here in the five towns, they will tell you. you see, you see those utility lines. You see yeah. those wires. The top. That's that the wires. That's considered part of the air. Yeah. Well. You see, that uh, an area is des- is is designating a certain area as being within the confines of a thing that is roped off by. Usually, it's like a fishnet string. Usually, you it's can't so. By the way, it's so interesting. Um, I the guest I had on meaningful people a couple of weeks ago, Rifka Shotkin. Her father is Rabbi Mike Shotkin. Yeah, and he what he does is he put ups he puts up Arabs. So Arabin. Yeah, Arabs. Arabin. <laughs> He puts up Aravin. So he sent me a video the other day, last yeah. Friday, from Manhattan. Yeah. And he was putting an Arav back up in Manhattan because they had to take it down for the Thanksgiving Day Parade. I asked him why they have to take it down. He said it wouldn't go over well in the headlines if SpongeBob well, got <laughs> taken down from, from uh, Arav. Yeah. It's like that plane that hit a utility uh, uh, line uh, somewhere in Maryland. Oh, that's just tragic. Uh, yeah, the, the people survived, but they oh. had to shut off the power to 80,000 homes in order to get them down off the power lines. I bet that pilot was always a troublemaker in school. But I bet you the Arab is not good in that community for this Shabbos in, in Maryland because a big part of the Arab and the group here in the five towns and probably in Brooklyn and Muncie and other areas is a is a team of people that check the Arab every, yeah, every Friday. Friday. And, but the Arab consists of a gr- big uh, a majority of the of the Arab here and elsewhere consists of utility wires. Now, you can't just see the utility wires here and say, well, we're in an area. You have to have the, the permission right. of whoever the local government is uh, telling you that um, that you could use it. So that was the nature of the contract, I guess, with, with Mayor Adams, as it is in uh, other uh, other communities. I, I totally hear you. You know, uh, what else uh, What else is on your mind today? Uh, uh, speaking about Iran, I, someone I saw over last weekend told me that they met the chief rabbi of um, of Iran. Oh really? He was, uh, he was in Muncie, so you see, he's allowed to go back and forth. You know, oh. he's, uh, he, he travels back and forth. You why see, does he not like? Why does he just like leave? The, the, his name is Garami, G E R A M I. I don't I don't remember his first name. Uh, I can't look at my phone. Rabbi Garami. Uh, rabbi Garami is the chief rabbi since 2011 of Iran. There's about 25,000 Jews in Iran. There's dozens of shuls. You're there. saying you, but we once discussed this. You said the Jews can't leave. Um, they, uh, they certainly can't, all 25,000 can't, uh, you know, pack out? go to the airport and pack out. Iran wants to have uh, Jews to show the world that they have no problem with the Jewish religion. Iran wants to have Jews, Jews so they have Their a Their problem piece. is with, uh, with Zionism, and that crosses over into an old conversation we had about what Zionism is, okay? So, uh... You go, go back to that episode if you want to hear about it. Yeah, it's kind of, <laughs> it's complicated, but it's a, it's a good thing. But it's complicated, but from an Iranian perspective, or that from a, 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 a radical anti-Israel perspective, they could turn it into something, uh, uh, you know, uh, very negative and, and, and very damaging. So uh, it really comes ba- down to, uh, to uh, dressing up anti-Semitism as being anti-Israel. You see, yeah. when, when, you, when someone is critical of, of, of Israel, they love parading out Jews that are critical of Israel. Because, hey, look, it can't be an anti-Semite, he's Jewish. Yeah, speaking of Israel, a lot of people responded yesterday to our our Aliyah episode saying, you know what, I would love to, but I just can't afford it. I can't make that move. I just don't have the money to do it. I think that's a fair claim, no? Well, life is life in general is expensive, I think. I think is it more expensive there? It might no, be. it should be less expensive there. You Why don't, you don't should have, it you be? don't have you don't have the shiva tuitions that you have here. Uh, what were they saying? Going for to visit? It's too it's too expensive for people to just go for a week. Well, I mean, because you had a, mentioned yesterday that you know people that haven't been there in ten fifteen years. Right. Yeah, but it's expensive to go as a tourist. It'll, the, it'll cost it'll cost five six thousand dollars at least. The people that I have in mind uh, that I was thinking about, uh, I can't say it was anyone specific, but generally speaking, the people that 
allow 10, 15 years to pass without visiting Garrett Yisrael, especially in this day and age when it, when it's so open. Um, it's it's not that it's not about the expense. It's about uh, it's just not a priority. It's too accessible. You're saying. Not, it's just not a priority in their life. The life people generally speaking on the conventional circumstances are, are busy. They're busy with their family. They're busy with their kids. Uh, they're just busy. Why? So, yeah, they're going to Cancun and they're going to Panama and they're going to Bahamas. Those are those are short trips, you know. Oh, so it's speaking. a long flight. I they get know. Ambien, knock I yourself know. out. You wake up in Israel. It's a it's a it's a it's a long flight. Listen, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of reasons why people don't have going to Israel as a priority, and it shouldn't be lumped <coughs> together with Cancun and Miami and and uh, <coughs> other how about, vacation how about, how about people going spots. to Greece and Italy and Poland? I imagine those people go to Israel also, right? Um, I, I think people that have an orientation to, to travel probably manage to uh, incorporate Israel into their uh, itinerary uh, if they're traveling already to Greece or, or Poland. Um, and listen, uh, Israel's a central factor in, in all our lives. Uh, our children go to school in Israel, they go to yeshiva, they go to seminary. Some make aliyah when they're young, which again draws us uh, to go there. I believe that my father decided many decades ago to be buried near Israel because he was afraid that his kids are going to be one of those people that mm. are going to be too busy to incorporate Eretz Yisrael into their lives. We're going to be busy with our jobs. We're going to be busy with, uh, with, uh, with our families. It'll be distracted. It'll be expensive. So uh, I'm sure you had a own personal motivation about why you wanted to be buried near Eretz Yisrael. And you have a better question is why didn't he go there while he was still alive and live there? That's another question. Well, I don't think, he, I don't think he, he was planning on dying when he died. Uh, yeah, but he bought uh, he bought uh, a place to be buried ten years before he died. So he made a it wasn't a, it wasn't a last minute uh, decision. He made he also a, bought for your mother for buddies? Yes, yes. So he made a he was made that a, a decision they both made? Or? He, um, no, listen, uh, I don't know. I don't know the mechanics of the decision making process there, but uh, but he made a, a conscious decision long before that was within the realm of possibility. Wondering about where you where you're going to be buried. He decided, even though his parents are here in Queens and. Uh, now some of his siblings are, are in Queens, um, that he wanted, he wanted Eretz Yisrael. And I think part of the reason, outside of his personal motivation for himself, uh, I think is one, of his, one, of the, one of the motivating factors to him was that his kids should have that, um, feel compelled. A draw. To, that, yeah, he, he, he thought that, I think he thought that we needed that. And I think he was right, you know. Well, you and, go to, to go to his cave here. That's one of the reasons. That's one of the reasons that I. Going pretty uh, soon. That's why I make it a priority. You know, it's not that I wouldn't go otherwise. I would go otherwise, of course, for a number of reasons. But um, I'm compelled. I'm additionally compelled to go because the yard site is on Hanukkah and, uh, and 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 so on. I hear you. Well, today is a big match: USA versus Iran. Yeah. What else you got on your? Oh, we 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 discussed the uh, guy that was arrested in uh, Far Rockaway. Oh, well, walking around with a machete. We didn't discuss that. We, we discussed, discussed before about the, uh, it yesterday that he was doing that. But then, yes, he was arrested and then he was let he was, go. He was arrested and released. Uh, uh, you know, it's very funny how the story changes in a day, you know. So uh, the police didn't, uh, yesterday we left off, the police didn't want to go into the building if they saw him going because he hadn't committed a crime. You could walk down the street with uh, a knife. You could? or um, Yeah, I guess you could. Well, I can't, and I don't think so. It's not illegal. I, like I said yesterday. No, uh, the the crime is, <coughs> and uh, anyone out there who thinks I'm wrong can correct me if I am actually wrong, is concealed weapon, okay? doesn't mean you can walk around with a gun, holding your gun up high in your hand, but the the, the, the criminal code is about a concealed weapon. This guy was walking around with what looked like a machete hanging from his belt. Yeah. And uh, he allegedly asked a couple of yeshiva guys in Farakway where the nearest synagogue is, okay? And he went into a building, and the security patrol called the police, and the police came, but they didn't go into the building, okay? They were waiting for him to come out, according to the information that I got, okay? And when he finally came out, I guess yesterday sometime, It was like 15 police cars that, <laughs> that, that, that got him. When he finally, when he finally came out, uh, they determined, number one, if you see my note from the uh, Rockaway Nassau security patrol, they said it's just a neighborhood nut, some, you know, some kind of lunatic, and that he was walking around with gardening tools, mm. you know? Maybe he was looking to rake leaves by a yeshiva. Yeah. Or a shul. Or maybe maybe wanted to plant flowers in the in the backyard, but you can go into any of these stores here. You could you could buy you can go to Costco and buy a set of knives. 
You could buy scissors. You could buy so. Knives. You think like we're just a little bit trigger happy and we're oversensitive? Well, no. You know they say if you it see something, scary. if you see something, say something. If a guy's walking around with a, uh, uh, even a gardening tool that could do that, that could do damage, and uh, and he's asking guys where the nearest shul is, uh, then that comes under the category of seeing something and saying something. You have the right thing to do. Is yeah. That doesn't make you uh, prejudiced or racist because you call police. Yeah. You're trying to protect your friends and neighbors. Totally hear you. A big mouse tov. This is a I feel old moment. Big mouse tov to Yaakov Shweki, who welcomes his first grandchild into the mm. world, a grandson. Uh, really nice. Yeah, he is now a Saba, and um, that's that's something that makes my generation feel pretty old, because he was like this young, clean shaven, young rat singing on the music scene. Really, so his first, uh, his first grandchild. You texting him? No, no, no. I'm just looking. I'm looking for my notes that I sent you this morning. All right. Um, okay. 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 What else you got on your mind? I think that's pretty much it. So uh, you know, you got a cold. You went to a Ranger game last night. So I don't think okay. I got the cold at the Ranger game. It was, it was cold there. It was cold. There was ice. Okay. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's our episode for today. Make sure to sign up to, on WhatsApp to the Daily Thread WhatsApp account. Uh, we're posting news and 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 uh, good stuff all day on that status account, clips from these episodes, and exclusive content. Uh, so go ahead. The link is in the description, in the show notes. And, of course, you can email us at thedailythread at meaningfulminute or meaningfulminute.org. That's thedailythread at meaningfulminute.org. Um, we didn't say the word Trump once. Well, there it is. Have a great day.